Thank you, Chuck. So as, as Chuck mentioned, I am a, an attorney. And my firm, Brandon Isaacson, has had a, a long relationship starting with the catalog industry and then moving into the online space. And they've been, so we've been on a journey with our client in data marketing over several sort of several generations of technology. So this, this topic of privacy has been mentioned in a number of the a number of the panels so far today, and it really is a major issue in, uh, in marketing. Uh, as you see, it's in the news all over the place from issues about uh, collection of data, data about children. We have data breach issues with the Equifax uh, breach or the Capital One breach. Uh, data usage, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, that really was the one of the reasons that we have the CCPA today was about because of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And then this one, the bottom one, is one of my favorites. I just saw the last week that the University of Alabama has a mobile app which tracks a student's location in the student uh, fan section because the head coach was upset that students were leaving before the end of the game during a blowout, didn't want to be sitting in the sun in 100 degree heat. And so if you stay in this, in this section long enough, you get a better chance of getting tickets to the games that matter. So there's been some, uh, some uncertainty about that. And so, with all of this in the news about uh, privacy, we're also seeing a lot more regulation. I don't have the GDPR up here. Obviously, that was a big groundbreaking uh, regulation that came first. We now have Consumer Privacy, California Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA. Nevada and Maine have just enacted new laws. Uh, new York has a new data breach law, and there's discussion in New York about a new, uh, new data privacy law that would be similar to the CCPA in New York State and wouldn't have some of the carve-outs that the CCPA has. So this is, you know, legal regulation is, is here, more is coming. And then there's always the danger of being sued under existing laws. Uh, there are biometric privacy laws. Google was, uh, was sued over Street View. That was a case under the state uh, wiretapping laws. So Google was, was collecting Wi-Fi data as they drove by in the Street View car, and they were sued in California about that. So we have being hit by all, on all sides uh, with privacy regulation and laws. What I'd like to do today is sort of give first a brief overview about privacy law, what it, what it is, where it comes from, what some of the themes are. And then drill down and focus more on the California Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA, which is coming into effect on January 1st, 2020. And then after that, open it up for Q&A. So at the, up until the CCPA, which was the first comprehensive online privacy act in the United States, privacy law in the US has been a real patchwork. We have certain sectors have had privacy regulations, but they haven't had a single overarching law. Uh, we have the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act that governs the collection of data about children. That can be an issue for apps, particularly gaming apps and uh, any, any type of app that may be used by kids. Uh, very strict requirements about getting parental consent before collecting children's data. Um, email is regulated at the federal level. People who are sending texts and SMS messages have to be concerned about the Telephone Consumer Protection Act that requires you have written affirmative consent before sending a text message, a commercial text. And then the FTC has been involved in terms of enforcing, uh, enforcing privacy policies. So if you say that you're not gonna do something with data and then you do something with data, the FTC views that as an unfair and deceptive trade practice and will investigate. At the state level, we have uh, unfair competition laws, the wiretap laws that I mentioned, and every state has some form of a breach notification law. If you have a data incident, there's an obligation to alert uh, consumers that their data has been compromised. So we've all gotten those because we've had enough major data breaches. Every one of us has probably been notified more than once that our data has been breached. And then I mentioned the sort of the private attorney general concept where individual attorneys and representing plaintiffs will sue a, a company for privacy violations. When I, talk, when I think about privacy law and regulation with my clients, I look at it in terms of, of different types of themes. First, there are the privacy practices. What do you do? 
Next is transparency. What do you tell people about what you do? How do you communicate that to them? Then security, how do you protect data? Because I think that, that we talk a lot about the, the challenges with CCPA about restrictions on use of data, how do you honor people's choices, but oh, some of the biggest risk is if you have data that was not properly protected uh, or somehow you know, fell into the wrong hands, there's a great risk of litigation in the, uh, and not to mention the damage to your reputation if you have a security incident. And then I think about choices. What, what do, can people tell you about what they want you to do with their data? In the privacy practices theme, I explained it here, we have, you know, this is really just how are you using, how are you using the data? And up until the CCPA, really, the rule in the United States was largely if you tell people you're doing it, you can do it. There wasn't a great deal of restriction outside of certain protected categories health information, banking information, um, for universities and schools, student information. That is starting to change. Uh, transparency, this is the big one in terms of your privacy policies. It continues to be the case that it, the most crucial thing you can do is communicate in your privacy policy to your customers how you're collecting information who you're sharing that information with, how it's used, and what choices they have. The things that people have been getting into real trouble for are when they say, you know, we will not do this, we'll never sell your, your information, we'll never share your information, um, we don't collect this type of information. And then it turns out that they were doing the thing they said they wouldn't do, that's a problem. Had it, so many of those practices, had they been properly disclosed, would not have gotten a company into trouble. And then with security, this is, a, this is a, a very crucial aspect for anyone dealing in data, and particularly with when you talk about apps, the kind of data that it is possible to collect is so intimate and so personal that security becomes even more important. Um, if, you know, depending on the type of data that, is, that comes out in a data breach, that will certainly impact the risk that you have and the exposure. They're also anyone that accepts payment has got already has uh, security requirements to the PCI data security standards. And it's important to have in place a plan for what happens if and when there is some type of a data incident. That could be a breach like we saw with Equifax. It could be something inadvertent. You send, send something to, uh, to a vendor but you get the wrong email address, it auto completes. And then you know, the horse is out of the barn. And so you need, to know, you need to be able to notify consumers under those data breach notification acts. You need to be able to notify state regulators if necessary. You need to have a plan in place that you can activate quickly so you're not scrambling to think about how to respond when time is really of the essence. And then consumer choice, these are the choices that you give to consumers. This is the, the place where the CCPA is really gonna change the game and People really need to start thinking about how to, how to provide choice, how to notify consumers of their choices, and how to honor those choices when they're exercised. Uh, I think it's already quite standard to provide customers with an ability to opt out of things like behavioral advertising, but that is going to become an actual legal right in California and, and very soon across the country. When you think about apps in particular, what makes apps unique? The, We've talked a lot this morning about the increased engagement that you get through apps, and that has to do with the personal nature of, of the way people use their devices. That is, it creates risks in terms of, you may, you may find yourself with access to the kinds of information that people are particularly sensitive about. People may be surprised that, that certain kinds of information are being shared. I think Mike mentioned that the Weather Channel was getting sued, is, has been sued by the city of Los Angeles. The Weather Channel app always disclosed that they were using location data and they were using location data to deliver forecasts, but they did not disclose that they were using location data for targeting ads, or, and that's my understanding of that lawsuit. And so that, the location is very sensitive. Where was I at a particular time on a certain day? So people are, are really going to be focused on that. I think that that's gonna be an issue for for more and more apps 
going forward because part of what makes an app experience so valuable is the ability to personalize it and the ability to, to personalize the messages and ad messages that people receive. So if it's surprising to people the way that the, that the um, data is being collected and used, and then particularly if it's contrary to the privacy policy, that's going to be a big problem. But there also are opportunities. When someone downloads an app, they get shown terms and conditions that they can agree to. And so you have the ability, as when you're using apps, to have opt-in to a lot of practices. And that is a very powerful, powerful thing. It's really a sort of the gold standard if you can opt people into something. And you can opt them into terms and conditions, including, uh, in some cases, dispute resolution provisions. Moving on, this is sort of the meat of, the meat of our conversation this morning, the CCPA. This is, as I mentioned, the first, uh, the first comprehensive privacy law in the United States. The story behind the CCPA is it was originally written by an advocacy group. It was a little bit, um, a little bit stricter than, than the Privacy Act that has been passed. And this group collected enough signatures to get the CCPA on the ballot as a ballot initiative in California. In California, if you pass something by ballot initiative, you basically can no longer change it. You need a two-thirds majority vote to repeal or amend a ballot initiative. So the California legislature, in order to retain some control over what California law was going to look like, ended up passing the CCPA in about 36 hours, right at the end of the legislative session a year ago. No one had really read it. And so it happened in a hurry, became law, and then we have spent the past year um, since that was passed, trying to work out what, it, what the final law will look like. There has been a series of amendments, uh, although most of them really did not make significant changes. The California legislative session just ended last Friday. Uh, so that's, the, that's how we got to the CCPA, and it's not, a, not the most comforting story for people who you know, are going to be subject to it. The way I'm breaking this down into the four themes I talked about, the way that the California Consumer Privacy Act hits all of these is with privacy practices, it focuses on sale of data, consumer opt-out rights. There are specific requirements of what you disclose, when, and how. There is a private right of action, so an individual California customer can sue a company in the event of a data breach for actual damages um, caused by a sort of a negligent failure to maintain adequate security protocols. There is not a private right of action for a failure to provide the correct disclosure requirements. That was something that had been pushed for, and that's a, a good news story for, uh, for app developers. But there are a series of new consumer choices, data rights for California customers, and we'll talk about those in depth here. So the law goes into effect this January, January 1st, coming right up. The purpose of the law is to protect consumer privacy. The, the law itself uh, mentions the Cambridge Analytica scandal. There is a, a real desire on the part of the legislature to give people more control, more understanding of what data is collected about them, how it's used, and more control over it. Uh, it does so by imposing notice and obligations on companies, and it applies to businesses doing business in California. What that means, so a consumer is anyone who's a resident of California, a business is someone that does business in California, and there are a few uh, limitations to that. So if you have annual worldwide gross revenue of $25 million, or if you buy or sell personal information of more than 50,000 consumers, um, or are controlled by one of those businesses, then you are subject to the CCPA. And buying and selling data is not as simple as, you know, selling data for cash. It can be other kinds of good, valuable consideration received. If you share information in exchange for having information shared with you, that fits under California's definition of selling information. The categories of personal information is also quite broad. It's information that identifies, relates to, describes, is reasonably capable of being associated with, or could reasonably be linked directly or indirectly with a particular consumer or household. Exactly what that means is going to, we'll, we will see how that plays out, but it's a very broad definition, and it's not, it's not just uh, 
previously in the, a lot of the state data breach context, when you talk about personal information that would require a notification to a consumer, you're talking about first, first initial, last name, and a financial account or social security number, government ID number, this sort of this real core personal identification that could lead to identity theft. The definition in California is much broader. It really is, can you figure out who these people are um, and you know, reasonably be linked? What, you, what it requires a customer to do is inform consumers what personal information you're collecting before or simultaneously with collecting it. And um, that, there is, there is still some, I think the industry is trying to figure out exactly what it means, what is required when it says you have to provide notice before you do the collecting. I think that, that the view is that if you have a privacy policy that adequately discloses your practices, that, you know, that ought to be okay. It, it, I don't know that you necessarily need to have a, a pop-up and opt-in, although certainly with an app upon installation, you ought to have an agreement to your privacy policy. Uh, and if your privacy policy changes in a material way, you ought to get agreement again. And this is the other, another challenge to implement is you need to provide the information to the customer on request. And what that means is if, uh, well, let's see if I have, a customer who, who, who asks for their information has a right to know not only what you're, you know, not only to, to have a disclosure in the privacy policy, but to actually get from you a report of the information you've collected on them and access that information. You have a right to deletion. Customers can have the right to, uh, to ask that you delete their personal information. So you've collected information, you have, you've got great data on, on your customers, your users, uh, you need to have a system to take them out of your, out of your, uh, your database upon request. You need to have a way of implementing a request and verifying that the request is from the person who they say it's from. If you sell personal information or disclose it for business purposes, you have to disclose that information on request. So I, if I, as a California consumer, want to know how, are, how is my information being used and shared, I'm going to have a right to ask a company that collected the information, what, of, what information about me did you share with third parties? What was that information? Who were the third parties? What are they doing with it? And so, there, I mean, I think that a lot of the, the litigation and the headlines that we see about privacy are really about this sort of the opaque information infrastructure and ecosystem that underlies the entire internet but that a lot of users are not aware of when and feel kind of creepy about when they find out about it. And you have a right to opt out of this sharing. This is, this is something I was talked about in an earlier panel. It's going to be very important to have a way to, to sort of, on a, on a user basis, remove, uh, remove individuals from data that's being shared in the aggregate. So, um, you have to provide notice the customer has a right to opt out of the sale or disclosure of their personal information. And if it's requested, if someone chooses to opt out, you have to honor that request. This is another big one. You cannot discriminate in price. So you can't have two separate prices, one for people who will share their information and not exercise their California consumer privacy rights, one for people who don't. There's some nuance to this. So you, you can't just say, well, you know, this is a free, this is a free ad-supported uh, product, and if you choose to opt out of having your, having your information shared, which is what makes the ads valuable because they can be targeted, then you have to pay us some amount of money. There is a bit of a, a bit of nuance there in that you can have different prices for different qualities of products. You can have a premium product, um, and if the the a different price that you charge has to have sort of some reasonable relationship to, to the cost of things. So that also remains to be seen exactly how that will play out. And you may offer customers a financial incentive to let you collect their data. I think this is where the legislature kind of wanted to go, was, was to give customers a kind of choice and say, well, we think our, our information is valuable, but we're willing to essentially sell it to you. Um, and I haven't really seen that in 
can practice a lot yet. There is, as I mentioned, there was a, a discussion about who could sue you if, if you didn't follow the California Consumer Privacy Act. And there was a big push from consumer advocates to have to extend this private right of action, which includes a right to sue on a class action basis, to any violation of the CCPA, which would mean that if you didn't have the right disclosure up at the right time, if someone asked to see their data, to get access to their data, but you didn't give it to them within the timelines, that they could then sue you. That's not the case. You can basically, the, an individual can file a lawsuit under the CCPA in the case of a data breach. So there's been unauthorized access um, and there's been damage as a result. But, the, uh, and if they sue, they can get either their actual damages or a set amount, $100 to 750 per consumer. And these sorts of statutory damages do really drive litigation because say you have a data breach that impacted 10 million California consumers, you're gonna have a lawyer that's gonna multiply 10 million times 750. And you know, that is a, it's a good place to be as a plaintiff lawyer and a bad place to be as a defendant. There is a right for the attorney general to sue to enforce other violations. And in that case, if a consumer thinks that they've, that they've had a, a violation of the CCPA other than a data breach, they can ask the attorney general to, uh, to enforce it. It could be cured within 30 days. And here, here too, you have uh, civil penalties per violation. And so the, the big question is what, is, what does all this really mean? And the, the, the law goes into effect uh, January 1st, 2020. That's the effective date. And so by that date, under the law, you should have uh, companies that collect information from their, from their customers and about their customers should have notice of their practices up. They should have a notice of their, the rights of consumers to request access, to request deletion of their data, and to opt out of sh data sharing and selling. And they should have a system in place for verifying those requests and implementing them. We, there is a target date of July 1st, 2020, for the Attorney General to begin enforcing the obligation. So this is a bit of a grace period. This is sort of the, you know, the, the little bit of good news is that there will be a six month grace period before which California, you know, California is not gonna file any lawsuits, the Attorney General, until July 1st. There also is a process ongoing right now where the Attorney General's office is trying to develop regulations that kind of flesh out some of these, these questions that, that are so vague right now. The question of what exactly does it mean to have verifiable customer consent? Um, those types of things. And that process is ongoing. We haven't seen the regs. We don't really know. So we're, we're going into this brave new world, fairly blind, um, but I think that people need to be, certainly need to be aware that there are, are real obligations with real teeth. Uh, it's coming in California, the largest state, and it will probably be coming in other states going forward. So that's my, uh, that's my presentation. I'm happy to take questions about the CCPA. Yeah, just real quick, what, what's your take, uh, Josh Wetzel, company One Signal? Question on uh, a federal regulation. I know yes. there's been a lot of discussion about that and, and overarching, where do, we, where do we stand there and, and do you think that's imminent or? I have to say, I, I don't think it's imminent. It's a, it's a great question. So there, the, the CCPA caused a lot of, uh, certainly a lot of uh, hand-wringing among the, uh, among the industry, and I mean, it, it, it's in California, the home of the tech industry, right? It, it's, a, a, it's mostly going to affect, I mean, it will affect very significantly companies that are a major part of the California economy. So there has been, there certainly there's a lot of desire on the part of the industry to have a single federal privacy regulation. And if, the, if Congress were to pass a law, it would preempt the state laws under the Supremacy Clause. So if, if the federal government decided to have a single federal privacy law, that would be the law. That's what's happened in the world of email. You have to comply with the Can Spam Act when you send emails, but you don't have to comply with the Kansas Email Spam Act or the Ohio Email Spam Act. Unfortunately, you know, getting anything done in Congress these days is very difficult, and I, there just has not been productive movement on it. People are, are talking about it, but I don't see it, frankly, I don't really see it happening. And not only that, 
I think that it is an issue where there are very powerful advocacy forces on both sides who, you know, and so it's, it's not, I mean, it would be better for the industry to have at least just one rule so you know what it was. But I don't know that there's any guarantee that it would necessarily be less onerous than the CCPA. Okay, another question? Hi, yeah, Michelle Novak, I'm with Iterable. You were talking about the, the buying and selling, like you have to be in the business of buying and selling data. Yes. So can you make some clarity around that? Because obviously everybody's very concerned about it, but that seems really specific. So the, the, the challenge is that the way that selling data is defined in the CCPA is it means to, to sort of to sell, transfer or share for some valuable consideration. And the way that, that, that we're interpreting that and that we're seeing a lot of others interpret it is it applies to much of the, of the data practices that we see. Certainly in the, in the multi-channel retailer world, it's very common to, um, you know, to engage in sort of co-op marketing uh, where, where data is shared collectively for, for purposes of targeting. All of that, I think, would meet the definition of selling. So it's not just like me selling my mailing list to you for, for a cash value. It could, it could be a broader scope than that. And the, much of the, I mean, we will see. It could, it could be that, that things get a little bit more narrow. But I think a lot of the data practices that enable the kind of targeting that, that sort of underpins the internet are probably going to fall under that definition. And I think that's the way the Attorney General in California will, will interpret it. Uh, lastly, can you talk a little bit about the actual notification that's going to be required? Is it the fine print that's at the bottom that nobody reads, or is it going to be something different? Sure. Well, so, so I, that's a, a very good point. And something that, one thing that, that the CCPA requires is for companies that meet this definition of selling information, it, they need to put a link on their web page. And, and the CCPA all talks about, about websites. So you know, here we're at, at an app conference. I mean, I, I think that some of the, note, the provisions are specific to what goes on your website. So it may be that you know you download the app and then have to go to the, the website of the app in order to exercise some of these rights, although how that works will be individualized. But there needs to be, among other things, a link on your homepage that says, you know, do not sell my information. So if, if you want to opt out of having your information sold, that needs to be a very easy thing to, uh, to do. Now that having been said, again, when you think about operationally, what does that look like? You need to find a way to verify a, a request. Certainly, if, if you have, if you only have information about registered users, I think it makes sense to, to have that. You know, basically send those people to their user account. They have to log in with their password. You know who they are. It becomes trickier with uh, different, depending on the relationship that you 